The, uh, the, 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 the plan today is to talk about visualization. And so we're gonna show, I'm gonna show you a bunch of pictures, give you a little history, um, uh, and then we'll end, um, uh, depending on how much time I gave to Peter, um, uh, so now I can blame him for like, going over all my lecture is not on my slides. Um, uh, we'll, I'll demonstrate at least some, some hands-on some hands pieces. There's an R script and some sample data in the uh, Dropbox folder. There's also um, a couple of Payek files, and I can, I'll demonstrate what that looks like so you can play with it if you want. For those who are not on a Mac, you can do it on a Mac, but it's a real pain in the ass. Um, so uh, this, the, the plan today is to really, the, the object of this, of this piece today is to help you be a better reader and consumer of network visualizations and to hopefully help you produce some better ones yourself. And I like to think that there is a good scientific reason and justification for this, um, uh, for the ways in which we do network visualization. It's often the case that we do them really poorly. And so if we can come out doing them a little bit less poorly, that would be all the better. So that's what, kind of where we're going. Um, as always, I'm going to be sort of blistering through stuff. Um, so you should just say, like, whoa, Moody, stop at any time. And I'm more than happy to you know, stop. So we'll see where we're at. So, um, to start at the beginning, right? Network analysis has always been a visual medium. So there's been, when we remember the very first day when I gave the overview, I said that one of the features of network analysis is that it has this visual component that people want to make with the invisible visible. And this has been true from the 1930s through the 40s. Like all the work on network science, among, well, what, what used to be is called network analysis, um, uh, was always about find, coming up with these pictures, right? But the ways in which these pictures developed was really um, ad hoc. And part of what we want to do is think about what do these pictures actually represent. And so let's go back a little bit even further to not just the, the introduction to um, network science per se, but the notion of the introduction of graph theory. And so the graph theory was invented by Wheeler when he came up with this notion of the seven bridges of Kronensberg problem. And it's a fun little problem, right? The idea is how do you figure, can, can I get across each bridge once, but only once in this place? Right? And it, you, you would know that for, because there's an island in the middle of the city here, is what makes it difficult is the way this thing is set up. If the thing looked just like this, right? if you could just go across the river from the left to the right, to the left, to the right, to the left, it'd be a simple problem. It's pretty trivial. But it's trivial because you can see it, right? because I have a picture. And it turns out, in fact, that the, way the invention of networks and graph theory came from taking this little bit of geography and abstracting from it and realizing what you really have is a point in a couple of lines. And if you think about these overlapping lines, then you can think about this abstraction problem of the movement across the physical space, which is different than actually figuring out where the island is. And then it answers the problem in a different way. And the other early sort of versions of a network visualization come out of kinship, right? So if you look at some of the work that Morgan did on early, early kinship ideas, and we know what a great, great, great grandfather is, and we can think about cousins and so forth, right? Moving past that, we might think about bureaucracies. This is a Russian bureaucracy. It looks a little bit like Duke's upper administration. Um, you have a handful of people um, uh, at the top and a few other people that you've never met. But they're getting paid a lot. Um, but the idea is right that we've been thinking about reporting lines um, uh, as a way of as a, a visualization, and that's been a formal way. But the actual sort of notion of social network analysis, a formal representation of informal social relations, did come, I think, largely first from Moreno and his studies of, of runaways um, uh, in um, uh, his book, Who Shall Survive? And these were um, uh, young, young adults, um, uh, uh, adolescents, um, uh, that they were, they were part of you know, a, ho uh, a home at the time. The, the mental health care was not something we would endorse these days. Um, but they, 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 they basically locked these kids up and um, subjected them to some various and sundry kinds of, of supervision. Um, but what Moreno wanted to do is figure out what kind of um, interaction um, uh, we could think of if we were to just map these. And what he did is he came up with two ways of thinking. He said, let's take that positive ties would be in red and negative ties would be in black. And if you look at this particular network, what becomes immediately obvious, right, is this little character down here, CM, nobody likes, right? So nobody likes this person. This person likes one person who likes another person who doesn't like them. If you remember Craig, right, poor CM has got some mental issues, not for any other reason than the fact that everyone hates her and her friends are unbalanced, right? So you, it's not surprising when you look at this that the division in this, in this cabin might be centered on what's going on here. And if you were a counselor, you'd want to make, make some sense of it. Um, if you look at younger kids, um, as he did as well, um, uh, he used um, triangles for boys and circles for girls. 
these are, I think, fourth graders, if I remember right, but these are essentially very young boys and very young girls, and they both think each other are icky, and so there are no relations between the two. Um, and Moreno did a lot of this kind of work. In fact, um, my favorite diagram of his is this one, um, which I've never been able to find a color version of. If any of our folks from New York can get to it, it might, there's a rumor that it might still be at the Moreno Institute. This is actually about life size here on the screen. It was about four foot by six feet um, in three colors. Um, these are each of these circles is a cabin. And within each of these cabins, they mapped the relations in the same way that you saw before. And then they looked at interactions between. And you had positive ties, negative ties, and I think it was an information flow. I can't remember exactly what the third one was. Um, but these were all done by hand, right? So this was literally a big old screen. And they sort of recorded the relationships by hand and sat the RAs down with a pen and a ruler. And it's like, you know, if you think the work is a little bit sort of cumbersome now, you know, your RA job isn't quite that bad anymore, right? Um, now, I'm not sure you get a lot from this image, other than the fact that, damn, there's a lot there, right? And I think that was kind of the interest. And, and oftentimes today, visualizations have this same feeling, that there's a little bit of um, sort of just a whiz-bang wow about them. And it's not you clear you get a lot of science. And what we hope to do is sort of move from just the whiz-bang wow to a little bit of the science. Some of the early work, though, that was done by hand was just really, frankly, beautiful, right? I mean, from a, from a piece of you know, art, art um, uh, some of this stuff is, is quite nice. There was some in, this is um, some work being done um, on a community network. So they would go in, Lundberg and Steele went into communities and asked each person in the household who they visited with. And then they sized them based on the social prestige, um, uh, and, and they had a prestige scale at this piece. One of the things that was nice about what they did is, um, if you go and read this book, every um, uh, line that crosses a page going out is matched to another line going in. So the actual diagram was incredibly careful with this kind of hand coding stuff. I've toyed with the idea of pay paying one of the Dean RAs to code this by hand so it seems we could look like, but I've never had the guts to actually ask them to do it. Um, uh, but it does seem like the kind of task that it'd be really fun to see what we could do with. But the, the kind of things that you get out of these diagrams and, and what Lundberg and Sue were looking at, they were trying to make sense of the social status structure of these communities. And so you'd find the mayor's wife, and some of the other sort of community leaders were at the center, and you'd have other people on the other side, and so forth. And it was a very nice way of thinking about um, uh, the ways in which a social system was organized. But what they went for was a, a notion of depth over breadth, right? So the reason these networks spread across 15 pages in the book is because they um, uh, really wanted to dig in on what each person's local network looked like, and there's stories in the book about each of these local leaders. Um, at the community level, right, you can, you can have this idea of layering over more information. And one of the things that um, uh, was early done um, uh, was to take a particular node and put some other kind of information. In this case, it's the proportion of times you visited friends outside your neighborhood or not. And they added these little pie diagrams on top of it. Um, but again, the idea was to think about, can we um, add more information to the network? All of this work up to the 40s was entirely done by hand. And the only thing that guided where a tie was given was where the investigator thought it looked good, right? And the kinds of intuitive things they would do was try to minimize edge crossings. They, if they had a node that had a lot of ties, they'd put it in the middle because it was easier to put the nodes around it without crossings and so forth. But there was nothing systematic about it at all. A bit later, Amon Othaway came up with this idea to really systematize this notion of central versus peripheral. And the idea of central versus peripheral was, was encapsulated in this thing called the target sociogram, which is um, in, the, you know, in the age of school shootings is a little um, unfortunate. But the idea is that the most central nodes were at the center of the target. And then as you got peripheral, you go on the side. This is an elementary school, a classroom. And so girls were on one side, and boys were on the other. They did this, in this case, analytically as opposed to so sociologically. So there are relationships across. But they deliberately put the males on one side and the females on the other. And you could um, then sort of distinguish between nodes that have lots of ties that you'd put in the middle and those that have few ties that you'd put at the edges. And because it was still the 1940s and 50s, you couldn't um, do it without having a little bit of something cute on it. So you could have um, uh, little boys with bow ties or little girls with um, uh, bows in their hair. Right? But the good part about this is there was an algorithm for doing it. Um, this is the original machine in machine learning, um, uh, where you had a pegboard that you would put your pieces in. There's a 3D version of this, which is they actually rigged up um, a set of abacuses um, uh, together um, uh, and put rubber bands both between and within layers. So that was the original uh, multi-layer network um, uh, to work with the pegs moving on that. But they really, literally, the idea was you'd move it around with the rubber bands until you minimize crossings, and there, and there you were done. Um, the rubber band idea is going to come back later. The, 
once you get a diagram, I'm not sure, maybe it's the, it's the engineers in us or something, but we can't help but try to layer on more information. So one of the things that started happening was to try to, to layer some idea of a, social of a social index. In this case, it was an SES scale, a socioeconomic um, status scale. It's on the, it's on the Y axis. And then the, the, the X axis was just used to try to minimize um, uh, crossings. It didn't work. Right? Like, this is a mess. And one of the things that you're going to learn as we go through this, that there's a very, there are very few times, I mean, the thing about social structures are that they tend to take up a lot of space. These are multidimensional features. And we're limited to two, maybe three dimensions to display in. So as you're trying to layer more information, you've got to be really careful if you want to give up one of those dimensions of the display space um, uh, to, uh, to, 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 make, uh, to lay out the diagram as opposed to um, something like coloring or thickness or something like that. Um, over time, right, we got a little more um, uh, uh, detailed about this, right? So once the computer age comes in, we get to really big networks. Um, uh, some of the early work in the 80s and 90s um, uh, was coming out looking at ways to explore um, uh, networks interactively, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but at the same time, when networks were taking off and being really exciting, they also sort of got really popular. And as they got popular, they kind of started getting silly, right? And so you started seeing a lot of these kinds of ads show up about viral marketing, right? So if I give a hand lotion to somebody, well, they also give it to somebody else, maybe somebody else. Or maybe if I'm a political reporter, I'm trying to expose the political elites, I'll see which kind of business leaders shared um, uh, schools together, right? Or maybe if I'm a consultant for the DOD, I'll decide that the best way to make sense of the Iraq war is to put it in a network diagram. Um, uh, and if you wonder why we were stuck there for so long, um, uh, that, uh, that might be it. And as these things got to be more and more common, you'd see them come up, and in fact, there are even political cartoons. Um, uh, your friends make you fat as a network um, uh, is kind of, um, uh, is, is deeply hilarious. Um, but, you know, we can get, be up here and be uh, sort of, you know, high and mighty about this if we want, but the honest truth is that a lot of, you know, peer-reviewed published sociograms look like this, right? These are just disasters. They're complete hairballs. Um, uh, they, it's something you might pull out of your sink, and it doesn't really look like something that you're going to learn a whole lot about, right? And so what we'd like to do is have perhaps not this, right? We'd rather not be a joke, but we'd also rather not be meaningless. I mean, one of the key features that we're going to discuss as we go through is if we're going to really make the idea that Moreno made right, that we make in the invisible features of social structures real and visible, we need to make them real and visible in a way that has some scientific integrity to it. So if we literally want to make the invisible visible, we have to find a way to do it right. And I think the way to do that has to start by asking, what are we really trying to show? What's the advantage of a visualization over something else? Because you've just spent three days now learning how to calculate metrics. Well, why don't we use metrics, right? And so think about this problem for a second. Um, uh, this is a classic problem in data visualization. If I give you a regression equation, right, where I have a, an x variable and three different y variables, and I regress x on, or y on x, I'm going to get some summary statistics for this. And in this case, all four, all three of these series have the exact same um, a summary of pieces, right? The correlation is the same, the regression, the sum of squares, the standard error of the slopes. Like, I can come up with a contrived example where all three of these are exactly the same. And you're probably saying, yeah, Moody, you just flipped a couple of nodes on either side of the regression line. You know how tricky this guy is. Um, and in fact, this is what you might expect that to look like. It's a nice positive correlation. It scatters around the regression line. You get a positive regression line, so that's what you get. But it turns out the second series looks like that. The third series looks like that, right? So all of these series have the exact same underlying metrics, right, but very different patterns. And that's the thing that makes visualization powerful, is that as human critters, someone call them bingo, um, as human critters go, um, uh, the idea that we have this capacity to see patterns and identify patterns is you know, sort of hardwired in where we're at. And what we're really doing is simultaneously looking at not just the relationship of x to y as a mean or something, but we're also looking at the distance between each of these pairs of pieces simultaneously. And the ability for us to see a pattern make some of these things much clearer than they do, would otherwise. Now, a scatter plot is something that whether or not you, want to, you might not admit it is something you've been taught to read, right? So you've learned how to read a scatter plot over years and years and years, and there are conventions built into a scatter plot that you're probably not even aware of that yours is right. So the main thing about a scatter plot is it's a pairwise data array, right? So I have an x value and a y value, and I put it on a plot. An x value and a y value, and I put it on a plot. And so this represents my x, y pairs quite nicely, so does this, right? This is the exact same data, 
right? So if I were to go through and reconstruct the data table, I can take each pair, put it to the Y, and go through it. But what I did is I threw away a key element of the information, which is the underlying display space should be ordered, right? We expect the x-axis to go from low to high, not to be a randomly sorted piece, right? It would be nuts to produce a, a sociogram with a randomly sorted piece. You are in a, a scatter plot, you would never do that. Um, and yet we wonder why we get three different pieces with not much more than random distributions across the piece for a scatter plot or right, for a sociogram. And so my point of this little silly exercise is that there's obviously a value to a scatter plot. The value is that because we understand what the underlying space is, that it's a double ordered array, we can make sense of what the arrangement of the points on the space means. Right? We need to develop that same kind of heuristic understanding of what a social space looks like when we do a sociogram. Right? And in fact, we probably have one, or at least that's something pretty close, a little bit better than some of these might be. And um, uh, the example that I think, the, the, the answer then to deal with sort of all the multiple amounts of data is to steal directly from scatter plots. And so the Gapminder, as it, as it came out um, uh, probably about 10 years ago now, and it has, looks like more than that, um, 2006 is that picture, so at least 13 years ago. And the idea is that, the, um, uh, that we, oh, we keep our space for one meaning and we keep everything else for all the other meanings. And I'm going to borrow that convention as we go through the day. All right. So the point of network graphics are that they give us a sense of reality to the unobserved features, right? When you can show somebody a picture of their office or of the enemy or of their competitors, right? It really makes it possible for you to get a really good sense of what's there in a way that you might have had a vague understanding before. And you can often communicate really complex features quickly when they're done well. And more importantly, I think from a science standpoint, it provides this multidimensional insight. What all the metrics do, if a metric does a good job, is it captures one feature of the network well. Right? It captures one single dimension, such as the number of ties a person has, or how many steps it takes to get from one person to another. Like these kinds of centrality scores do one thing very well, but these systems have lots of things going on. And so what visualizations allow you to do is to take a more multidimensional view of the under underlying pieces, and thereby make more, a, more con a better contextual sense of what these metrics mean of what these metrics mean, excuse me. So this helps us think by organizing, arranging, and abstracting these generals from the particulars of the network. Right. So to do this then, I think we need to have this, this sort of rope going in our mind, which is that we're gonna move between three kinds of problems simultaneously when we do visualizations. We need to have a, a, a core problem, which is this, what is the knowledge problem we're trying to answer, right? What is the thing we're trying to understand? We have to make sure we're being as honest to the data as we can, and we then have to come up with a, a visualization strategy that does this. So these three things have to work together. And when they do this, we, we need to make sure that we're, we're doing it in a way that can somehow make sense of all the different things that networks do, right? So we've talked about these micro, meso, macro properties, and in some sense, we're gonna be able to want to do one or the other or some of these simultaneously, and it's gonna turn out that there's gonna be trade-offs, right? You can really do one of these things really well, but not all of them and so forth. So how do we do it? I'm a, we um, uh, tend to um, uh, sort of work with a set of heuristics. And these set of heuristics um, uh, are focused on doing some things uh, by solving problems in the layout space um, uh, automatically. And so for example, we might want to be maximizing the edge angles. That is, we don't want to have a lot of really narrow lines between each other. We want to minimize the number of edge crossings. We want to have a relatively even distribution of nodes across the space as opposed to having them pot, pot, pile on top of each other. What all these heuristics are, are the things that artists did in the 30s and 40s sort of intuitively. And so now we train a computer that says, well, this is a maximization problem, let's do one and not the other. And what's really fun about this is that if you give a computer program a mess, no particular arrangement, and the network, it'll do things like unfold this sort of piece for you. And I'm gonna show you some examples of that when we get to the demonstration part directly. But the problem is oftentimes these heuristics um, uh, maximize a single dimension to the network as opposed to all the dimensions we care about. And so this is why we need to um, uh, sort of make sure we understand what's driving the dimensions as we go. All right, so um, uh, just to, to, to drive home the point why we care about this, if you were to pick up an off-the-shelf uh, network analysis software, this came out of the software that's called YED, Y-E-D, um, uh, and just sort of draw the network. Like there are literally a dozen different um, uh, layout algorithms that I could apply to the exact same graph. So this is literally the exact same network 
um, uh, just drawn in you know, a dozen different ways. And so it's nice to have some guiding principles about why you might pick one of these solutions. Right? So this solution seems like a really bad one. Right? This one, which is hard to say, maybe this one's a good one. Well, why, why would I say that? So, how do we, so what are we trying to do then? So I think this, it, the thing that makes a good scientific visualization right, is the ability to replicate results. We want to make sure that we can produce the same basic kind of picture within some sort of flipping and rotation pieces. We want to have the, most of the features evident from the graph should be at least mappable to some kind of a metric. right? So there might be multiple metrics, but we want to make sure that what we're doing isn't just completely arbitrary. And, there ought to be, and these things ought to be theory relevant. So these are the, the scientific features that I'm going to try to focus on. That there's some ways in which we can do a, a, an actual sort of metric-based analysis of the, of the, of the layout um, uh, that is, uh, pro pro provides a correspondence between what we're seeing in the visualization and what we're doing in the um, uh, quantitative analysis. Now there's on the other side, um, uh, there's a communication feature of this, which is that we might get a really good scientific visualization, but we'd also like to have a beautiful visual. Right? So we'd like to have something that captures audience's attention and helps draw them into the piece as opposed to just make them sort of go over it with one piece. A lot of this is basic data visualization craft or style. I'm not going to go through a lot of detail on that. But think about careful use of the way you choose colors and line thicknesses and shadings can, can make a big difference between what comes out of the computer by itself and what you ultimately send to the publisher, right? And so the, the distinction between exploration and publishing and so forth will help guide this, but we'll talk about ways in which we can get to those pieces. Okay. Questions or comments on where we're going yet thus far? Again, he's, he's yammering quick. All right, so I want to talk about three basic types of visualization. Right, so this is, what, when you think about this, this what I'm going to say is, like, are we doing a 3D scatter plot or a 2D scatter plot? Are we doing a line graph or a bar chart? Right? So the, the way of thinking about these pieces are going to be the ways in which we array this space. And the, two, the, first two ty the, first, the three types are tree-based, force-based, and fixed coordinate on graphs. But the first two are these tree-based layouts versus a force-based or a spring and better layout. A tree-based layout, or is any kind, what I'm calling a tree-based layout, is any kind of um, layout for which one dimension of the space is meaningful, right? So here we have a top and a bottom, and the distinction between top and bottom is meaningful. In a force-based layout, in other, on the other hand, the main thing we're trying to do is minimize the distance between connected nodes and maximize the distance between disconnected nodes. And we do that, it turns out, by imagining a spring that's pulling the nodes that are connected apart together and nodes that are disconnected is pushing them apart. Right? So that's why we call it a spring embedder or force layout, is that there's a force pulling connected nodes to each other and pushing disconnected nodes apart. Now this network is this network. These are the exact same graphs. But in this case, I've applied a force-directed network uh, layout algorithm to a um, network that really has an inherent ordering to it. And, the, and the make a short, uh, a short story of it, a hierarchical or a tree-based layout is really best when there is some inherent natural ordering to the graph. So a command control structure, an RDS tree, some other kind of feature where you're flowing from, let's say, a diffusion seed node to the people who get sick a week later. Right? These kinds of things, there's a, there's a reason to think about the flow from top to the bottom. And so that, that, that dimension carries with it information. In this case, I could probably find the, the, the root of this tree if I looked really careful at where the arrows are and I'd see that this node has only out arrows and no in arrows, but it'd be a pain in the ass to do it. I, I'm not sure I'd want to do it. When a force-based layout really works well for is identifying this distinction between macrostructure and mesostructure. Right? So what you're seeing here is a, um, a, as a force-based layout applied to a network that has these kinds of clumps in it. And the beauty about clumps and clustering in a network is that here's a spring pulling me here, a spring pulling me here, a spring pulling me here. The thing about springs pulling lots of nodes that are connected to each other together is that it forces the idea of a friend of a friend as a friend, and it pulls these clusters to, uh, to be similar and near each other in the display space. So the reason that force-directed force layouts work well to identify social, so, social networks is because they tend to have this clustered meso level feature to them, and it pulls nodes that, where lots of nodes are friends with each other next to each other in the graph. Now there's lots of variants of a force-directed layout, and we'll talk about them a little bit. But if you were to take this force-directed layout and say, you know what, I'm going to treat this like a hierarchy because I'm certain there's a status structure in this school, and so I'm going to put the most popular kid on top and put the rest of them down, 
you get something that looks like this, right? And so it's possible to do, but the ordering isn't strong enough for that to be really a signal. Now the third version are what we call fixed coordinate layouts. And fixed coordinate layouts, the most common types are maps. Right? And there are times when maps are the absolute best thing to do because your audience knows where cities are. Right? They know that this is America. And so if I'm going to think about America, that these things are up in Washington, these things are in Florida, it's a sensible layout. The problem with a, um, a fixed, something like a map or other fixed coordinate layouts is that there are often other features of the coordinate system that are irrelevant to your social system. So in this case, there's this big range of mountains here and deserts and nobody lives there, right? And so there's huge space between the West Coast and everywhere else and the East Coast is incredibly dense. And so this looks like there's lots and lots of connectivity over here, when in fact, from a social standpoint, the, the risk set is just really small in this set. So if I were to take this network, which these are hospital exchanges, um, uh, these are exchanges of patients between hospitals, and I, instead of putting it on a physical map, I'd put it in the space-directed layout, you'd find that you know, um, uh, it's still the case that Washington is closer to California, um, but Florida ends up being relatively close to um, uh, you know, New York and Maine over here um, uh, than it would be in, in the layout. Oh, Florida's green, there it is. Um, yeah, right here. So Florida sort of bridges the mid-Atlantic states because all the retirees from the mid-Atlantic end up going to Florida for the winter. So the, um, the point, of course, is, is that this is a communication issue as opposed to science issue. If what I'm trying to do is to tell people, look, there are way too many hospitals in Florida sending folks to the mid-Atlantic to the, to the, uh, mid states, then it might be useful to see where Florida is. But you have to recognize you're going to take a hit in terms of the fit of the graph to the space. Now, when I say fit, what I'm doing is that if I really want to make this argument well, and say that what I would really like to have happen is that if you're close in social space, you're also close in display space, then why not just measure that fit, right? So I can actually take the correlation between your distance in the graph and your Euclidean distance on the screen and express that as a correlation, and that's what I'm calling a fit statistic, right? So if these things were 1.0, it would mean that your graph distance, the number of hops it takes me to get from node A to node B, would be exactly equivalent to the number of inches I have to move on the space, right? So that's what I'm doing here. And it turns out that the fit in this case is lower than the fit here because, you know, of the Rocky Mountains and the Midwest make it hard to um, uh, start stretching nodes further apart than they need to be. Now the other um, a common um, a fixed coordinate space is a circle. A circle is a stupid layout. It's like it's not entirely clear like where the, why this has come to be other than that it was computationally simple. The one reason to use circles when you're doing it some uh, sort of data collection by hand or drawing networks by hand in small settings is that you never get a layout because of the purpose of a curve means that you're never going to have one line going directly under another. You're always going to be a cord crossing as opposed to a line going directly other. But when the networks get bigger, that, that goes away entirely. One time that I've found um, uh, that, uh, that circle layouts are useful is when circles are applied to some other kind of space space. So in, ca in fact, in this case, what I've done is I've let the entire network lay out as it was before. Again, this is the hospital, co uh, the hospital network. Um, and then I took the centroid of each piece and set that as a circle. So what I'm doing here is highlighting the clustering, but you still get the relative positions of those clusters in the social display space. So it's a, it's a mix between the ability to see, well, this is a really big cluster that's very dense, and this is a smaller cluster that might be less dense, right? So I can look at that maybe a little bit and squint, and that's useful. Um, but by and large, um, I've not found a lot of um, uh, value in doing these kind of circular layouts, which is a little surprising because you've all seen hundreds of these things, right? Um, so chord diagrams are nothing other than a circular network layout, and I can't for the life of me figure out why they are the most popular di diagrams in U.S. News and World Report, other than the fact that U.S. News doesn't know how to do network analysis. So, um, so you know, to, to my way of thinking, and there are people in the world who disagree with me, obviously, um, is the, that this is the pie chart of um, uh, network analysis, and you should avoid it about that much, right? It's just not that, that is a very little information. The main purpose of a chord diagram is to show the flow from one sector to another in a way that doesn't bias you towards one part of the world, say if this were a global migration map or something, but you've lost so much information about proximity that it's, uh, it's hard for me to know what's there. This map is beautiful, right? I mean, this, made, this made the rounds a few years ago. It's um, the colors, the luminescence, all these kind of things are wonderful. What it really tells us is that the internet follows um, a population density and that it's really hard to get the internet in Mongolia. 
So, um, so just know that when you're doing a fixed, um, a, a fixed, uh, a, a fixed node or map or something like this, that that they, you really have to be careful about things like population density, and ask yourself if you're learning much more from this map than other than population density. Now, I'm. This is the pot calling the kettle black. I've published maps. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying you shouldn't do them, um, uh, but you should have a reason for doing it. So, for example, in our case, we wanted to, to make the point that the United States healthcare system should be thought of as a national healthcare system, and wanted to point out that if you start in Dallas, you're only two transfers away from every other spot in the country, right? And so, this is a way of helping people see that. All right, so that's my first point. First point is you should have some way of thinking about the display space that maps on to the communication and analysis problem you're interested in. If what you're interested in is hierarchy and your network and relations have a strong hierarchical um, uh, bent to it, then there are layout algorithms optimized to use that dimension of the display space. But dimensionality is a problem with networks. Networks are in the n minus one dimensional objects, and so you really have to, you're really paying a high cost to give up a dimension for one vector of information unless it's a fundamentally organizing vector. And that's also true in a space-based layout. If there is a particular space that is fundamentally important for describing your relationships, then it's worth giving up that space-based information because it's already clustering your graph in such a way to make that reasonable. And maps are probably one of the few places in the world where that's true, um, really only because your audience already knows the map. right? So you've gained that, that value in doing it. Otherwise, for most social networks, a space-based layout of some sort is what you want. Now the second point is that this is, and this I'm going to come back to this, this idea before that I said that I, that I sort of glossed over quickly, which is that networks are multidimensional objects. And I have two dimensions to display them in, sometimes three. We'll get to that, why that's not always a good idea in a minute. Um, and so what that means is I've now taken um, a, a, a very high dimensional object and I forced it into two dimensions. And what's lost when I do that? Right. There's absolutely no way, what's lost is accuracy. There's absolutely no way I'm going to perfectly represent this n-dimensional object in two, in, in two dimensions. And that makes people nuts, like, oh, crap, my, my visualization is wrong, right? Um, but it should be liberating, right? Because what it's telling you is that this isn't the right display, right? It's one of a number of all bad displays, right? And so what you want to do is find the, the best bad display that you can give that conveys the most information. And what that might mean doing is something that you would never consider doing in a scatter plot, but which I actually recommend in a sociogram, is you might move some stuff around by hand, right? You might move things around by hand. You might do some weighting in a way that highlights clusters. You might do some uh, features that highlight a particular kind of relations or a particular kind of node um, in order to help convey the scientific story you want to do, and that's perfectly legitimate. There's not, that's not cheating. It's not like biasing the results so long as you're honest about what you do and why you did it, right? So in this case, what I've done is this is the base raw um, uh, uh, distribution of nodes in the space. Um, uh, if I use a basic spring integrator, I think it's a Fruchtman Rheingold at this point. Um, and you can see that the clustering, and I applied a, so I was probably Louvain, knowing me, I applied the, a Louvain clustering algorithm to this to identify clusters in the setting. And you can kind of see them. So here's one cluster, here's another. This red cluster kind of bumps across and so forth. And it's just not as sharp as I might like to do, especially if I'm really telling a story about sort of the relations between clusters. So in this case, I just shrunk each cluster a little bit so that, they're, so that their relative within group positions are the same, but the between group positions end up being highlighted. Now, if you did this without telling people what you're doing, so people thought that they were getting this kind of group, and in fact, you gave them this one, that would be akin to giving them a log log plot as opposed to a linear plot and telling them it was, and having them assume it was linear. So you want to tell people that you've done it when you've done it, but there's nothing wrong with doing it if it clarifies something about how the relations are set. Right? Might also be the case right, that, you, that instead of having an absolute linear sort of projection space, that you really want to open up some of these spaces a little bit. You can do things like apply fisheye transformations where you, when you have these little knots of nodes on top of each other to where in this piece, you sort of spread the nodes out just locally. And that local distribution is going to cost you a little bit in fit, right? So the to your accuracy goes down a little bit, but it gives you that capacity to, to, to not have occlusion where these nodes are stacked on top of each other. And that can be a useful thing to do, right? 
So again, it's perfectly reasonable to um, change your layout by hand or to layer on different bits of, of, of layout pieces if it communicates the, the message in a way that's valuable. The only key is you need, and this is the scientific part of it, you need to tell people when you do it, right? The third bit comes from uh, this idea that I'm um, uh, straight out of um, uh, uh, the, the um, the, is to avoid sort of chart junk, if you will. I'm forgetting the, the right phrase for this. But there's a lot of things that you can do in network analysis um, uh, that um, adds extra pieces. So for example, curved lines. Um, uh, curved lines usually don't add a whole lot. Um, the one time they do is when you want to try to distinguish reciprocity or something. But by and large, um, uh, curved lines are prettier. They're sort of aesthetically pleasing, but they do take up a lot more space. They'll, 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 they're not necessarily adding to the overall piece. Now, the, the obvious solution to problems when you have um, a network that is um, a too big and too dense, can it work for me here? There we go. Is to do a 3D layout. Um, and that's what this is. This, is, um, this is, comes out of a program called Movie Mole. If it's going to work for me. The point about 3D layouts is that um, you do, the, the computer now is going to give a, have a better fit internal. So the distance in the 3D Euclidean space is going to match the social space much better. But as a viewer looking at it on the screen, you still can't see it. Right? So all these nodes now are behind each other. So 3D layouts tend to have what's known as an occlusion problem, that things are behind them. If you can get in there and move them around by hand, and actually as an exploratory tool, you might be able to get it. I actually got the Payek guys to um, uh, change the, um, a way they export these files now, so you can now actually send a 3D payek, payek option to um, a 3D printer. So you could, if you wanted to, actually print out your network um, uh, and have it as a, as a desk object. But um, other than that, it tends not to do so well. Uh, it's a different kind of desktop, the actual physical desktop. Um, so what do you do if you want to sort of have comparative versions of networks, um, and when might it be useful? I think the, uh, uh, a nice way of thinking about networks, especially if you have a, a constant frame of them, is to use an idea of small multiples. And so we came up, Jimmy Adams and Martina Morris and I had this problem where we were trying to communicate what it really, like what it feels like to have um, a, a network that has really, really dense networks versus really, really sparse networks. And um, how that changes quickly depending on things like the average degree in the network or the skewness of the degree distribution. And so what we did is we just generated these plots where we had, you know, this is what the degree distribution looks like and you get this kind of a really dense core and this kind of a fringe. And we just took little slices of it. And the thinking was that that might help communicate that it really is fundamentally different, even though the average degree is about the same. In this network, you're going to have all these little tendrils on the edge. And down here, it's going to be like a battleship or something, right? So there's this, this sense of difference. And um, you can go into each of these pieces and see what they look like. And this will give you some sense of what that 3D notion is, is that it's, when you can see it turning, you can kind of get a little bit of a sense of what's underneath in ways that you might not otherwise. Um, but as you get denser, Right, um, uh, you can see how these cores move, and it's a lot, a lot nicer as an interactive feature than it would be as a um, uh, as a display feature. And even then, it's choking this poor little machine. All right. So those are the the, the main sort of layout features are that you want to make sure your social space and your um, display space are as closely aligned as possible. So whatever feature is guiding your social space, use that. Um, and if it and there, if there is a hierarchy, use it. If not. I'm going to use the space-based layout. Um, if your um, uh, 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 relationships are such that there's a, some other science, sort of secondary scientific goal that isn't perfectly represented in the simple space-based, don't be afraid to futz with it a little bit, right? To get in there, move things around, and make it cleaner. Um, the second bit is to think a little bit about um, uh, the aesthetics of a display. And here I think one of the most important parts are to layer on reinforcing information. So one of the nice things about um, uh, something like a, a, this, this, spring embed, this is a spring embedded um, relationship of, a, of the Colorado Springs um, Project 90 data. Um, and we were interested in this case in um, really sort of highlighting the difference between um, central and peripheral nodes. Well, central nodes are obvious. They're at the middle of the graph, right? And so in some sense, it's redundant to color by centrality and size by centrality. But it helps you see it as a node. Your eyes are drawn to the big orange things and not so much to the little green ones at the end. 
I, do, I like color schemes that have sort of a natural sort of autumn to spring kind of um, look to them, but that's, that's just an aesthetic feature because I'm a hippie. But um, uh, you should pick something that works for you um, uh, in that sense. And, and there are some, uh, some, some, there's some good color theory out there for how to do it. Um, there are opportunities to do interactive tools. Um, if I can get over here to this. Let me just escape. Maybe it's work better this way. There we go. Copy. Come on. This mirror display is killing me. Um, there we go. So this is. This is one of the interactive tools that you'll see a bit of. Um, this is a, with a, 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 for, a force embedded layout for a small little made up network in this case. But what's fun about these is if you click on them, you can drag them around. All right, and so you can chase your network all over the place. Um, uh, it's not entirely clear that this is useful, um, other than so much as to help train us in how to think about networks, right? And so you, if, you, if you really want to help build your own intuition about what these networks look like, you can say, hey, I think this node should be on this side. And you can play with it a bit and see what happens when you futz with it. When I told you the first day that the x and y ax axes don't matter, this is literally what I mean. Like, this network means the exact same thing, even if I just rotate it here 90 degrees. And it, it's, if I take this piece and try to really jank it out, it's just not going to work, right? It's going to come back to where it's at. Um, the uh, kinds of pieces that you can do with this, there's, a, there's some, there's, I'll show you at the, in the demonstration um, uh, some software for generating these things. Um, this is a, a nice one that Karen Healy put together um, uh, on all philosophy co-authors um, uh, in a, over a group of time. I forget what his time period is. Um, but again, you go in here, you can see the graph, but you can see each network that is tied to each other and there it looks static until you grab one and you can drag it and sort of spring it around. Um, it's, these are fun to play with, and, if you, and as a, I think the, the main advantage of these as a, as, a, as a scholar is that if you can get your audience to look at them, like they're gonna get so fascinated in there digging and dragging around that they might actually pay attention to what's under the hood. Um, uh, and so if you really want your people that are reading your article or your piece to um, go in and do it and interact with it, you can do something. But um, there's not a, I mean, let's be honest, this is kind of a gimmick. There's not a huge amount of, um, of value to be had from that. Um, but interactive graphs that can be useful um, uh, do a lot of work where they um, overlay search with a network. Um, let's take this one if I can. Um, this is a bit out of date um, uh, because um, uh, in this case, this was before he was, this was candidate Trump, unfortunately. Um, uh, but the, uh, um, this is a, uh, uh, an opportunity to where they, the people who built this particular graph piece have layered on a database underneath the network. So then you can have um, interested parties go in and see who uh, each of these companies are connected to both Trump and something else. In this case, it's one of Donald's um, holding companies um, that he's managed to pass money from one side to the next through. Um, and so you can sort of go in and find these things and see where they're at. So if your goal is to go in and sort of see what pieces are there, it can be nice. There's some really good ones of these that have been done with um, uh, interlocking directorates. There's a, a piece called um, uh, theyrule.org that Sky Binderdemol put together. There's another one called Oil Money, um, uh, which is nice, which looks at political contributions, um, first in California, but I think overall of the country now. And it's, it's a way to help, it really does energize um, people to get in and sort of see these connections um, uh, in ways. There's a nice version of the Panama Papers that have been done this way. So, um, as a way of, of building an information set, they can be kind of nice. Oh, stop that. All right. Yeah, I'm not going to deal with that one. Um, or that one. This one is going to let me. Come on. Why is that still on? Stop. 
There we go. See, the problem is it's bumping me out of screens. So if you have dynamic data, one of the fun, th fun things to do is to take this space-based layout idea and um, turn it into a movie. Um, and so in this case, we've animated the network. This is, the, this is the, some of the data that Craig was talking about. These are kids in high schools or in, in elementary schools. And so each gray node is a child. Um, uh, a lecture sort of communication from the teacher is in black. Um, joking around is in blue. And um, negative um, interactions are in red. And so there you see there for a minute ago, the teacher was just yelling at a student. The kids are joking with each other and breaking it. Now the teacher yells at everybody, right? And it breaks into a mess. Um, uh, the teacher is still yelling at them and the kids are joking and laughing at each other. And the teacher decides to do the um, smartest thing and um, divide and conquer. And you'll see that here um, uh, in just a second. And you're gonna send them off into work groups because um, uh, he just completely has no control over this. There's very little teaching happening in this classroom. There we go. So he says, go work at your desk with your partner. <laughs> Um, uh, and you can see, though, of course, that they're not actually working. They're just joking with each other um, uh, over this type. And then he pulls seven aside and says, you know, you're busting up my classroom. Why are you doing this? Um, and so it's a nice, these things about these animations is that they're fun ways of being able to really get a good sense of the rhythm of a social setting. And so if you have a chance to, um, uh, if you have data that is in continuous time or near continuous time, you can kind of get the sense of when, you know, something regular is happening. You're getting nice routine activities versus when you have, you know, this all hell, all hell breaking. And it's um, a, kind of a nice way of, of capturing that kind of um, uh, a social system. As it, just, just for your edification, this is an algebra class with a substitute teacher. So um, the, the, you know, the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the teacher didn't have much of a head start when they went in. But um, the, the advantage of um, the movies are that they're engaging and they, they provide a way to abstract from real time, but yet um, help people see things. We've done them a lot with um, baboon networks, for example, you can see the, the kinship structure sort of grow over time. Um, the hard part is, is humans have very poor visual memory for movement, right? So I, you can tell me a story probably about the big picture arc of what happened there. But the details are missing. And so for, for, for most display purposes, we found that small multiples work better than a movie um, in terms of communicating a long-term story, right? So the movie is great for getting a sense of the rhythm but if what you really want to do is get a sense of how one um, a node um, a sort of might change its position over time, then actually the small multiples work much better. I'm going to keep this here because I'm not sure where I'm at. Uh, so this is the version of the small multiples, right? So instead, instead so this, you, saw, you just saw a movie of this network. Um, uh, if instead we were to say, let's look at it in five minute intervals, and I could just say, well, is the teacher always in the middle or does the teacher get pulled over to the side or whatever? And that makes it a little bit easier to see some of that kind of stuff. Um, another way to think about networks, um, uh, and this is going back to the, some of the other ideas that Peter and I was talking about a moment ago, is that if you can abstract from the details and think about the, the meso level structure or the, or the overall structure, um, you can often get a lot of really um, deep insights about a social system. And so in this case, um, this is from uh, Harrison White's book, Anatomies of Kinship, um, which if you haven't read, is probably the deepest book in sort of, of social network analysis um, uh, from a role standpoint that's out there, where he takes all of the ideas of traditional anthropological kinship models and boils them down to a few simple um, uh, um, network rules. And to give you a sense of what that is, you can think about a kinship network as an ego who has a father, a mother, a brother, a sister, a wife, a son, or a daughter, right? So this is the classic um, uh, uh, anthropological kinship um, uh, uh, nomenclature. And if I have a father, then my father might also have a father, a mother, a brother, and a sister. My mother has a father, a mother, a brother, and a sister, and so forth. And you can go through each of those pieces and imagine that my daughter has a husband, a son, or a daughter, right? And these are the, the kind of relations that um, exit out of me to my, uh, my one-step kinships piece. But you could also then just compile those into one single diagram. And this single diagram captures the rules and the patterns inherent in a Western kinship structure in the 1950s, right? So if you think of ego sitting behind all these relations, as an ego, I can have a father who could have a father and have a father and have a father and a father. My father's brother, right, is my uncle. My father's brother's wife is my aunt. My father's brother's husband doesn't exist in 1950. You see it's a directed arrow, right? 
So these are the kinds of things that allow you to map onto a kinship system. And it might be the case that I want to think about different kinds of relations that don't exist in the Western relationship, which are older brother versus younger brother, right? Which is older sis aunt versus younger aunt. And you can encode these as a pattern of relations. Um, the uh, other, so I like to think of that as a type of abstraction. The other type of abstraction that is useful to do is to move, is, is to sort of solve this problem that comes out of scale, which is if you have too many nodes on a graph, it's just hard to see what's there. So here we have a graph that's really not too big. This is about 2,000 nodes. Um, each point in this case is a journal in social sciences, and the ties between them are the similarity and the um, uh, co-citation pattern of the journals they, that cite them. And if you layer over um, uh, the disciplines on top of these, you can sort of um, think about the, the probability of finding a node in a small space, and thus you get some one big sort of cluster here of psychology, another big cluster of economics and law and political science and sociology is right in the middle. That worked out well for me. Um, though, of course, if you recognize that this is a really short um, a hill and these are sort of bigger hills. Um, but the nice thing about this is that you don't need to have, right, you don't need to have the points at all. You can just do away with them entirely. And if you go to the natural sciences, which are just much bigger than social sciences and would look like a mess, you can see what it looks like there. And there was kind of nice, um, uh, not to pick on the mathematicians who tend to think of themselves as being at the center of the universe. It turns out, in fact, that math is used everywhere, just like English is, but just like English departments aren't at the center of the social sciences, neither are they, uh, are they is math at the center of the natural sciences. Instead, it's chemistry that links sort of the math and physics world to medicine. <laughs> and that's the thing, that's, it's chemistry um, uh, that um, uh, makes the major bridge um, uh, in the natural sciences. But we found this to be a relatively interesting way or useful way of thinking about the interrelatedness of topics across literatures. And in fact, we've mapped all of the publications um, uh, from Duke professors in the same way doing this kind of thing. So that's one way of thinking about abstraction, is that if you can, you could sort of get away from the point and line idea and go to some other type of representation. And this is the, the challenge that Peter um, uh, gave me when we were sort of thinking about the, um, the co-political voting networks, right? So these are senators. There's only 100 nodes here, but it's not a sparse network. Most social networks are sparse. Everybody has, on average, you know, say 10 ties or something. In this case, everybody has 100 ties, right? And so being, being tied to 99 other people at different, um, uh, did just, that only differ by strengths makes it a really crappy sociogram. And so the alternative is to use something like uh, a heat map, um, uh, which is, Peter already showed you much better than this one, um, uh, or to otherwise um, uh, abstract on the social process. And I'll, I thought I had another slide of that, but I'll come back to it. And so another type of abstraction is to map directly the social process you care about on the network. So if you don't really care about the network, but you care about diffusion on the network, then map diffusion, right? And so um, that would be the thing that you want to do. And this is, this is the image out of uh, uh, the Katz and Menzel paper of uh, tetracycline in the 1950s, and the point was that the popular physicians in the um, uh, uh, community adopted this new drug much faster than the medium um, uh, popular or the unpopular physicians. And the argument was that those that were popular were likely the center of the network, they learned about the information and thus adopted quickly, whereas those who were unpopular were at the edge of the network and they, they just didn't get the information in time and only caught up much later. Um, I like to think about diffusion um, uh, on a network um, uh, as actually this trace problem, right? So if you wanted to think about the diffusion potential in a school or in a school network, you could actually simulate the diffusion from every single starting node to every other node. There's your degree distribution, the number of people I can reach in one step. There's a the number I can reach in two steps, in three steps, in four steps. And what you see, right, in this particular school is a rapid difference, right? High variance in where diffusion might happen depending on which node you start with. And so you can layer over this all kinds of different information to make sense of where, um, uh, of how dangerous this um, uh, uh, particular setting is to another. And what we'll show you tomorrow is you can compare this distribution to a random distribution or something like that. Um, diffusion um, uh, coloring doesn't work so well. Um, uh, I find it works much better um, uh, if instead of um, trying to color the nodes, you do this, right? So if you actually look at where your, where your infection starts, and trace that through the network, you can see that some of these nodes who started um, uh, reached a lot of people, or a few people, and others reached a lot. In this particular case, we were trying to um, examine the um, likelihood that uh, concurrency was contributing to the flow of um, a pathogen through the network. And so we colored each line by the likelihood that, or by whether or not it was concurrent with anyone else. And so that's to say that this, these red and orange lines were concurrent. We had two definitions, it's not, gonna, it's not important right now. But um, 
the kind of works. You can see that there's a lot of concurrency on this set and maybe a little less concurrency over here. But what really matters, it turns out, is if you think, well, does the path from one node to the next depend on the concurrency? Um, uh, we color that as if, if, if any of the um, uh, ties upstream in time um, uh, were, were concurrent um, uh, and, could it, and could the infection not have passed without that concurrence, then we, we code this one as red. And you see that all of these long, long distance paths depended on concurrency earlier in the tree. So this is a way of thinking about this kind of um, uh, diffusion problem in a way that um, abstracts from the underlying social network and focuses on the social process that we want to have going through the network. Um, I don't know why we have that. And now this, we've, we've shown this graph now a number of times today, um, or this week. Um, this is the Ad, Ad Health Romantic Network. Um, a couple of things that I do that um, uh, you, know, you can decide. I always work with my political biases of my audience. Um, uh, I think it's a useful thing to do. So Republicans are in red and Democrats are in blue. And boys are in blue and girls are in pink. Um, you know, you can pick a different color if you want. Um, but uh, most audiences will know that if they see it. And it can be an effective way if you don't want to get past that kind of um, uh, translation exercise. Um, on the right here, what you see is we've kept the um, uh, layout exactly the same. So this is collapsing time, right? So this is all of, them concurrently, all, all of the relationships as if they happened at the same time. And this is when they actually unfold by week. So we've asked, we asked each kid I mean, in the school who their romantic partners were um, uh, within the last six months. And some of them started up to a year ahead. And so this early sparse outcome are ones that are still ongoing within six months. These are the ones that are going like within the current six months of the school, right? So you see... Adolescent relationships don't last very long, right? And so you get these little pieces here and there. And then what looks like, you know, just a massive crash in the romantic um, uh, uh, relationship structure, that's just when the data collection ended, right? So um, uh, it wasn't that the administrators found the data and stopped everything. It was just that we, you know, we stopped collecting data. Um, again, if your interest is, is in how things flow through a net like that and how that flow is determined by the spread of or, or the timing of relations, it might be useful to actually represent the network as a temporal flow. And so this is a version of a multi-layer network that Peter was talking about where I'm just showing you the active edges. And so here there's a tie between B and D at time one. That tie keeps going um, at time two. B stops being act interacting with D at time three and starts interacting with A. And so you can get this flow of people through time in this sort of multi-layer representation. And what's nice about that is that we can then trace infection just by following the arrows, right? So it's possible for B to infect lots of people. Um, C over here can't, in, can't ever infect B until after about time five, right? And so this, this kind of representation is a nice way of thinking about um, the temporal aspects of networks. If again, what you care about is how flow moves through the network. Uh -huh, they're out of order. So here's the, um, uh, the way of thinking about this kind of temporal abstraction. Again, I bet my movie doesn't work. It's really frustrating because I'm using this machine because it, this morning it worked um, on this machine. Well, um, again, the point is that you have these really dense networks. And so what we thought about in this is if you really think about what a co-voting network looks like, this is a, a one-mode projection of a two-mode network, what you're seeing here is that all of these nodes that are a little bit different in space are really just doing the exact same thing. This, these folks are voting um, uh, party line Democrat. These folks are voting party line Republican. And there's a few sort of you know, people who are in the middle doing something different. And so we can actually sort of save ourselves a lot of time by literally asking how, how often, how similar are you to your peers in the way you vote? And that's what structural equivalence is, right? So if you and I vote the exact same way. Like every time Peter votes yes, I vote yes. Like every time he votes no, I vote no. Then Peter and I are exactly structurally equivalent. And you know, when Dana votes yes and I vote no, that means that you know, she's smarter than I am and we just you know, go the other way. Um, and so you can imagine this process playing out. Well, what that means is that a lots and lots and lots of these ties are just redundant information. Right? They're not telling me anything about the social system. All of these people are doing exactly the same thing. These people are doing exactly the same thing. And so instead of representing them each as an individual, I can just represent them right, as, a, as a cluster to themselves. And that's what we did um, uh, in this piece. And so in the uh, graph that Peter showed you before, each of these nodes is just everyone in here is voting exactly the same way. And so they're completely substitutable. Right? And in the 50s and 60s, or this wasn't that late ago, but this is in the 70s, 
people, um, there were a lot more people who just didn't vote like everyone else. Right? There's always been in our political system people who vote essentially on a party line or in a block, but those blocks differed on lots of different things. And what characterizes today is that if you have a particular label, you always vote exactly the same way. Um, and the, one of the points that I, um, uh, the, I didn't bring an example of this one, but one of the points that um, I like to, make, to draw from this graph and have used in other places is that if, if there's one thing that structural equivalence can do for you, even if you don't become a block modeler along the structural equivalence line, is it can really simplify your graph. If you have one of these really giant graphs, you'll often have a huge bunch of people that are just hangers on or have one degree nodes or something like this. You can collapse them and then sort of make them differ in size and thus simplify the representation. So again, if you're doing this in a scatter plot, that would be like instead of putting up each individual point in the xy plane, I'd put a dark red spot there instead of a light red spot. And this is where this idea of sort of taking ideas from Gapminder comes from. All right, I got 20 minutes left here. Um, the main conclusion, I'm going to, I'm going to come to a, a, some, some, some substantive conclusions here and then get to a couple quick demonstrations. Um, questions or comments on the process thus far? All right, so um, the main conclusions, I think, is that um, the, the, the beauty of Moreno's sort of original hand drawing um, sociograms was, was, again, this idea that we could make invisible relations visible. And we do that by encoding the information in a way that we can understand it. And in this case, for Moreno, he was literally trying to develop a, a graphical language. And that's why he was always very consistent across his publications to use red for positive ties and black for negative ties. He had a little hashtag between them if they were reciprocal, right? So this is the kind of thing that he was trying to do to develop a language of visual networks. Um, I think that's, a, that's, a, 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 that's an impossibility. We're never going to all agree on the exact same representation of how we color nodes or whatever. Um, but I think what is important is that we be clear in how we think we communicate these elements. And that we um, build this intuition that social space is represented as distance and that size represents magnitude can be a huge sort of help in us understanding what the networks are for most of these kinds of sociogram representations. Um, if we want to think about language a little more carefully, we should, be, we should include something like a key. It turns out that um, humans are pretty bad visually at seeing the difference between a triangle with one line and a triangle with double lines. And almost anybody who goes through a visualization exercise to build these kind of things gets trapped down this logic of trying to add lots and lots and lots more detail. And most of the time, you're better off sort of focusing in on one or two pieces and not adding that detail. But um, there have been other attempts at it. Um, I think it's really important from a, to distinguish between the exploration phase and the distribution phase. So as an exploration phase of research, it's really quite nice to have just whatever the screen pops up, you can have a quick look at it, make sure something doesn't look stupid, right? There's a data cleaning check, it's great. But if you want to communicate something to an audience, it's nice to have this kind of distinction. And one of the main things that I like is to reinforce whatever the central me mechanism is with both color and size, right? And so in this case, where we're enforcing the size of the node is centrality and the color is centrality. That's redundant, on my end, the position from the center of the node is centrality. But it helps the audience quickly see what's going on in this setting, right? We also did, you'll also notice that um, I, we weren't at all afraid here to move nodes around. So this is the actual spring and bad, better. This is the Fruchtum and Rheingold layout. And you'll notice lots of nodes here that are on top of each other that I just sort of fussed out a little bit, right? So that kind of, of flaring can be really helpful to get a sense that there are, in fact, lots of nodes in this position as opposed to just one that shows up over here. At the end of the day, right, the real challenge is identified as this active grammar of networks. We want to make it possible for people to think about um, a pattern as a way that conveys a certain kind of information. And in most social systems, I think, it's the, the, the main thing that you want to convey with the network image is the distinction between the global level pattern and the meso level pattern, right? We very rarely want to point to a single node and say that node's like, you know, he's in trouble, right? Instead, what you want to say is there's a distinction between the social sciences and the physical sciences. There's a bridge between this group and that group, and that bridge is characterized by some kind of a feature. And that's what the meso level structure can give you um, uh, from the network visualization, and it's done best through these kinds of space based, space -based or spring and better visualization tools. Um, everything else ends up being extra. The other piece then, again, is to be very thoughtful about what you do, right? To just be, to, to take this as an opportunity to really convey something to your audience, right? 
Um, and, that the, and do not let yourself get in the habit of just taking what's off the page as the thing that you're being given with, but to treat a visual piece as, um, as important as the textual piece. That is, if a picture's worth a thousand words, you should think about how long it takes you to write a thousand words you want someone else to read, right? And spend at least that much time on your visualization. Um, uh, and I think that at that point, you're going to find yourself um, uh, producing a lot better um, uh, uh, pieces. So um, that's the, the sort of the, the philosophical sort of overview of this. Questions, comments, or thoughts before we jump into some pieces, please? So, um, how do you feel about a colorblind-friendly I think they're, they, sometimes they can be really nice. I think there's a lot of, and, and, and there's a really good reason to use them, right? Which is that if people are colorblind, then they can't see what you're at. Um, uh, the, 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 the unfortunate feature is, is that red-green um, uh, is one of the main colorblind distinctions. And in some contexts, um, uh, like Italy or Mexico, like red and green tend to be colors that have very strong political import. So you have to trade off between a colorblind sort of piece or whether or not you want your audience to be able to, to intuitively know it's there. And so that's, so when, that's, when that, that trade off is there, it's really sort of up to you to see how big are these relative audiences. In general, if you can do something that um, uh, you know, uh, is ADA compliant, I recommend doing it. That's a, a nice way to go. I do think, uh, so I'll show you some examples here in a minute um, uh, using the, um, uh, there's a, uh, a package in R where there's a, a, a bunch of visual scientists have developed colors that um, uh, are balanced in terms of the uh, uh, luminosity and things like this. The balance tends to make everything dull. Right? That's, the, that's the main problem with it. And it sort of tends toward the pastel, which is, um, you know, a little, it's great in spring, but the rest of the year is a little weird. You just made a variant. Mm -hmm. about um, our goal is not to, I don't want to get in trouble, but a lot of my work looks at, when I do that work stuff or whatever, but um, looks at the gaps, or is trying to identify if you move like, certain organizations to gaps, you know, right. and so, um, so you have a different problem than mine, <laughs> and that's great. Um, so, yeah, so in that case, then, I think I would really want to identify, so if, you're, if you really are in a setting, and I've, I've worked for DOD and some other places where we really do care about individuals, in that case, like the kind of display you give, you really, um, things like occlusion and nodes being behind each other really matter. And, and in that case, it's much more important to favor a heuristic that's going to unpack stacked nodes versus one that's going to, you might give up a little bit of fit um, in terms of this mapping onto distance in order to be clear which nodes are um, uh, uh, sort of in a similar point in the space. The main problem with that is that most of the unpacking that happens in these kinds of um, uh, algorithms is random, right? So if you think about where the space-based network goes, if this were our actual network and it turns out that there are you know, six nodes that are all structurally equivalent and on top of this, and that's what Fruchtemann Rheingold would give me because it's literally trying to get nodes um, uh, in the best space it can give. If I say, well, let's give a new heuristic that, that favors keeping nodes away from being stacked on top of each other, what you're going to get instead is this piece is going to come up here, and you're going to have you know, a bunch of nodes around the edge, something like this. Um, but their distribution in this space is going to be completely random. Right? So there is nothing about this that's, that's, that's meaningful. It's just the fact that so you, you, you just have to recognize as a reader that these things are all equivalent. And the fact that this node on the end is a little bit closer to the middle than this node is out here is not an interpretable feature, right? And those are the kind of trade-offs you just have to be aware of when you're working with this. Now, if you're looking for gaps, most of the time that's going to be the node in the middle, and it's going to be relatively easy to see, right? Other questions? All right, so I'm going to, there's an R script on the, um, uh, on the drive. Um, I'm going to, fire up my copy here and show you what that looks like. Um, if I can find it, there we are. Oh. It's really 